Hey, if there's one place that nobody wants to be, it's last place. Am I right? Now, there may be a few exceptions to the rule, but by and large, that truth holds true. Do any of you set out to finish last? Anybody? No. Does anybody like to be chosen last? Absolutely not. Does anybody like to be last in line? Not at all. Now, you may choose to be the last person in line at the potluck because your mom threatened to kill you if she ever saw you first in line, but that's not where you want to be, right? You want to be first. And who can blame us? We all want to be first because the greatest rewards in life go to those who are first. Hey, the best food, the best seats go to those who are first in line. Those who finish first, they get to hold up the biggest trophy and bonus check. Those who are chosen first, they receive the most recognition and the most status. This is just the way life works. You get what you hustle for, you get what you work for, you get what you earn. It is what is fair. This is the way it is, this is the way it has always been, but this is not the way it is to be in the kingdom of God, at least not according to Jesus. Listen to the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 19 and verse 30. But many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. It probably wasn't more than five minutes later that Jesus came back and he said it again, Matthew chapter 20, verse 16. So the last will be first, The first, I'm sorry, so the last will be first, the first will be last. Now clearly Jesus didn't want this to go in one ear and out the other. Jesus desired for this to really shape and form the lives of the disciples. He wanted this kingdom value, this spiritual truth to change them as a people. But what exactly does it mean? What's that statement mean, the last shall be first, and how should it shape our lives? Well, we find our answer to that question in a story, a story that Jesus told in the five or so minutes between those two statements. And at the center of the story is a group of day laborers. Now, of all the men that went out in the early morning hours to the marketplace of hoping to be hired for the day, this particular group of day laborers, they were chosen first. They were chosen at 6 a.m., And that meant they would get to earn a full day's wage. Now, that wasn't much. It was typically a denarius, but it was enough money to put food on the table and a smile on the face of your wife and your kids. But not only that, being chosen first to work the full day, that's a boost to the self-esteem as well. I mean, a handout's nice. It can be helpful. It's good at times. But I'll tell you what, it's nothing compared to actually earning something with your own hands, right? So I imagine when these particular men went out into the vineyard, as the early morning sun was rising, many of them thought this, man, it's good to be first. So excited, a smile on their face, first chosen, going to get to work the full day. This is great. But all the good feelings that they were feeling that particular morning, they were just swallowed up by anger that evening. What happened? Well, they didn't feel like that the compensation that they had received for a grueling 12-hour workday was adequate. Was it because the person who hired them tried to shortchange them? I mean, and that, that happened in the ancient world. But that was not the case at all. What exactly was the issue then? Well, there were another group of men who had been hired they didn't put in nearly as many hours, they got the exact same pay as they did. Now, some of these guys had only worked nine hours, and some of them had only worked six hours. Some of them had only worked three hours, and a few of them had only worked one hour. They had only worked one. That's not right, is it? It's kind of messed up. If you work 12 hours, you definitely deserve to get more money than the guy who shows up and works one hour, right? I mean, that's, that, it's not fair what's taking place here. And so they went to the vineyard owner, owner and they made their dissatisfaction known. 
9 through 12 of Matthew chapter 20. The workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. And when they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. Those who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. And you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work in the heat of the day. Now, while the vineyard owner was not guilty of unfair labor practices, one might question his, question his business sense. There is no doubt that this affected his profit margin. Created an unnecessary firestorm, storm, but it also affected his, his profit margin. I mean, you think about how much more money this guy would have made if he would have just stuck to the standard sliding pay scale that everybody else operated by. So what was his deal? Didn't he care about the bottom line? Well, yeah, I'm, I'm confident he cared about the bottom line. It's just not what he cared about the most. For this particular business owner, it mattered far more to him that every single worker would go home with enough money to put food on his family table, far more than making a few extra bucks. That's what mattered to him. And yes, fairness was a value for this particular business owner, I'm sure. Uh, but at the same time, the value that shaped his decision-making most was mercy. That's what mattered to him more than anything else. Now, when you live this way, there are some who won't get it. And there are many who won't like it. And there will some who will even think it's absolutely foolish. But at the end of the day, it was the business owner or the business owner decision to make. And to those who were crying foul, he reminded them that this is my decision. Verse 13 through 15. But he answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have a right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I'm generous? Now, it wasn't just the payment practices that proved this guy really cared deeply about people. It was also his hiring practices. Five times during that day, he went to the marketplace to see if there were men who needed to be hired. You say, why did he go to the marketplace so many different times? One possible explanation is this. He was an absolutely horrible project manager. That he had totally miscalculated the magnitude of this particular job. That may be the explanation, but that's hard for me to imagine. I think it's far more likely that this guy kept going back to the marketplace time and time and time and time and time again just to see, are there other people who are in desperate need of work? And when he went back at 5 p.m., there were still a few guys who were hanging around. And to this particular group of men, he had a question. His question was this. Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? So what's the deal? Hey, are you guys like some of those guys who like to stand outside and hold up a sign that says, we'll work for food, but the reality is what you're really wanting is just somebody to give you a handout? Is that, is that what's going on? And the answer is that's not it at all. These guys wanted to work. They were eager to work. The problem is nobody would hire them. See, these guys weren't last-round picks. These guys, they couldn't even get in the game. And why was it that nobody would hire these particular individuals? Well, think about it for just a moment. Who are going to be the people who are chosen first to do manual labor out in a vineyard? It's going to be the strong. It's going to be the big. It's going to be the young. It's going to be the healthy. It's going to be the quick, right? Who's going to be chosen are not chosen at all. It's going to be small. It's going to be the weak. It's going to be the old. It's going to be the sick. It's going to be the disabled. It's going to be the slow. 
these are the people who aren't going to be chosen. Those left standing around at 5 p.m., they were not the hireable types. But this vineyard owner, because he cared about people more than profits, he hired them anyway. Verse 6 and 7, he asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go and work in my vineyard. When you really think about it, it would have been a whole lot easier for this vineyard owner just to say, Hey, listen, here's the denarius. This ought to put food on the table. Just take it. Go take care of your family. That would have been something nice to do. It would have showed a deep love for those particular people. It would have made a whole lot more sense, too, because it's 5 p.m., work day's ending in an hour. How much are these guys really going to accomplish in an hour? Probably not a whole lot. And so why? Why did he hire them? He hired them because his concern was not just for the physical, but also the emotional. His desire was not just for them to be able to put food on their table. He also wanted to protect their dignity. So he hired those who nobody else wanted and treated them exactly like those who were chosen first. And that's what really ticked off those who had put in a full day's work. They were upset. The first round picks, they, were, they believed themselves to be far superior than those who were chosen last. And yet here's this vineyard owner who's, who's treating these guys just like they're, like they're equals. Like these guys at the very end of the day, the, the old and the disabled and the sick, they're, they're equal to us who are strong and healthy and have been doing all this hard work all day long. This to the first Draft picks is what they find to be the real injustice. Listen again to what they have to say. Those who are hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us? Are you kidding me? What an injustice. So, how does this story shape our lives? Well, I think one of the primary reasons I, I believe that Jesus told this story was to impress upon his disciples that there is no place for arrogance in the kingdom of God. There's no place for arrogance in the kingdom of God. In fact, go back to what takes place just prior to Jesus telling this story. Just prior to Jesus telling this story, Peter comes to Jesus with a question, a question that's no doubt on the minds of all 12 of the disciples. And his question is simply this, what's the pay for this gig? What, what's the pay? Matthew chapter 19, verse 27, Then Peter said to him, We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get? Hey, Jesus, working in your vineyard is not real easy. At the end of the day, is it going to be worth it? And Jesus responds to that question by assuring them, that the compensation package is going to be unbelievable. In fact, he says this in Matthew 19, verse 28 and 29. Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you, have follow, you who have followed me will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. That's exciting news, but it's also pretty heady stuff. Especially that whole part about you get to sit on thrones and judge. Hey, <laughs> that sounds pretty good, right? That can go to your head. I'm pretty important, right? And so in an effort to kind of just kind of keep things balanced, to, to keep the disciples grounded, not viewing themselves as being more important as anyone else. Jesus makes this statement about last pick people being just as valued as those who are chosen first. And let's be honest, we need this story as much as the 12 disciples, because none of us here are immune to an overinflated sense of self-importance, are we? Those who are consistently among the first, first to be chosen, first to ask to, be, to lead, 
first to speak, uh, first to be asked to share their opinion, first to receive praise. You're especially at risk. It's really easy to see arrogance in everybody else, isn't it? But it's hard to spot in ourselves. Now, one of the dead giveaways that maybe you've got an ego problem going on is if you refuse to invite or include certain people in your programs and your activities and in your meetings and the different things you do because you view them as being a little bit inferior to yourself. Now, let me give you an example of this. I'm going to give you an example, and I'll start by saying this. I haven't seen this play out here at the Campbell Church of Christ, but I'm not necessarily in this group anymore, so I'm not sure I would see it. I did see it in my younger years when I was a part of other congregations. And here's what would often happen. A family would make the decision. They, they were going to invite every kid to their, in their child's third grade Bible class to their child's birthday party with the exception of one or two. Now, why didn't that one or two kid make the cut? Well, you know why. Either they were just absolutely unruly children, or they were just plain weird. Or their parents kept them from being invited. Now, you've seen things like this happen, right? You've seen it because you've done it. We've all done it in some form or fashion, maybe not that exact example. I hate to admit it, but I've, I've done it, and close to that exact same example example. I can still remember making Turner's fifth grade birthday party list when this thought came to my mind. If I invite Wilson, there's a good chance his freak show parents are going to show up. And they don't really fit in with the rest of my friends. I'm sorry, Wilson, you don't make the cut. Now, just so you know, I ended up inviting Wilson but not because I wanted to. And say, why'd you do it? Well, when you're the preacher, you can't afford to offend or hack off other people, <laughs> even really the really weird or annoying members, right? I mean, it's just, it's one of the downsides of the job. You just got to keep everybody happy. You just, I'm kidding. A little bit, sort of. I'm kind of, <laughs> kind of, kind of, kind of kidding. Now, let me be perfectly serious with you. One of the big things that I'm reminded of from this parable is that we must imitate God by being inviters, not excluders. But like the vineyard owner, we must go beyond what anybody would actually expect to include those who nobody wants so that we can show them that they are truly valued by God. And if there's one thing that will get in the way of that is if you have a superior view of yourself. Now, another reason this story is told that I, I believe is to impress upon us that there is no place for envy in the kingdom of God. No place for envy in the kingdom of God. When certain people prosper financially or they get put into certain prominent positions, sometimes it's hard for us to understand, isn't it? Maybe it's not for you, but it is for me. I mean, there's a part of me that wonders, why do certain guys get to preach on TV and fly in private jets and preach to stadium-filled audiences, and I don't? I mean, I'd look really good on TV, especially when you add that 10 pounds that the camera adds. I, I mean, it just doesn't seem fair to me they get to do it, and I don't. But then I read this story, and I'm immediately reminded of this, that it's not for me to question that what God chooses to do, he can do whatever he wants with what belongs to him. And oh, by the way, everything belongs to him. It's, it's his decision. He gets to make the decisions. Now, for those of you who have a difficult time with this, this emotion, this sin called envy, I want to offer a couple of suggestions to you. Just try to overcome it. Number one is this. Remember that God is fair. Remember that God is fair. That's, that's not all that he is. He's more than fair. If God were only fair, then we'd be facing an, an eternity of misery because that's what our sin deserves. But God, who's rich in mercy, he gave up Jesus Christ to pay our sin debt. And because he was willing to do that, now us, the broken, the sick, 
the unwanted, we get to share in all the blessings of Jesus Christ. Paul touches on this in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 4 through 7. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Fair doesn't begin to describe the nature of God. He's so much more than that. He's so merciful and he's extravagantly generous. But at the same time, he is fair. He is fair. And that's one of those things that we need to hold on to, especially when it appears that there's no benefit doing service in the vineyard of God. Hold on to that truth that the nature of God is fairness. We're reminded of this by the author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. God's going to do what's right. He is fair. You're not going to be overlooked. You're not going to be ignored. It's going to benefit you. So just lean into that. Hold on to the fairness of God. Now the second just kind of uh, recommendation I would make is simply this. Stop comparing your blessings, or, or focus, let me rephrase it this way, focus on your blessings rather than the blessings of others. If the full day workers would have simply received their denarius and gone home, everything would have been just fine, right? The problem was the owner paid the one hour workers first, and so those 12-hour workers were expecting more, and when they got the same, they had something to compare it to, and all of a sudden, they're dissatisfied with life. It does not seem right. And we, it happens to us as well, doesn't it? So this summer, my week of vacation was to Rapid City, South Dakota. Went to Rapid City, South Dakota because that's where my family lives. My mom and my dad, my sister and my brother-in-law, they live in Rapid City, South Dakota. Rapid City, South Dakota is a nice place to go to. The Black Hills are there. Mount Rushmore is there. I got to spend time on a golf course. I went fishing with my brother-in-law. We went to some local restaurants were decent. Rapid City's all right. I was happy. And then I came home. And I came home and I got on social media and I saw some of you went to a tropical island. I won't name any names. <laughs> and I got home and I looked online and I noticed my old college roommate, he went to the coast of Italy. <laughs> and for a moment I thought, Lord, do you not know these people the way that I do? They don't deserve this. <laughs> I deserve this. It happens to us, doesn't it? So if you want to overcome that, you're going to have to spend less time comparing and more time counting your blessings. You're going to have to spend less time on Facebook and Instagram looking at the lives of others and praising God for the life you've been given. Now, it's not simply that we're trying to ignore what other people are blessed with, right? The real goal, spiritual maturity, is to be able to rejoice with one another in our blessings. I want to be able to rejoice with every one of you when you get to go to a tropical island. I want to rejoice with every single one of you when you get some position or something great happens in your life. But you might be in a place this morning where you're saying, I'm not sure that's even possible. Is that even possible? It is. It is, but you're going to have to go back to what we talked about two weeks ago. When you realize that the greatest treasure in the world is a relationship with Jesus Christ, you own that, you believe it, and you live into it, you'll find it so easy to rejoice with everyone else in the temporary blessings of this life. So that's my challenge for you this week. It's not to ignore other people. It's not just to focus on what you have. It is to immerse yourself in a relationship with Jesus because that's where the true blessing is found.